Yes, sir. And Armante, right? That's how you pronounce it? Armante. All right. <clears throat> What's going on, everybody? This is Brian Turner here with uh, another episode of the No Stress Midwest podcast. Here we're on season three. We're doing a Black Excellence season. Uh, we're lucky enough to be joined by Armante Marshall from Temple. Armante, how's it going, man? Doing well, fantastic, man. I appreciate you having me on. No, I, I appreciate you you being on and accepting it. So just a little background. So Armante and I have never met before. We, uh, we have a mutual friend, and we're going to kind of talk about him, uh, Joe Amico, who is one of our podcast guests. And Armante actually coached him. And I think it was Joe's uh, like surprise Zoom birthday. We're just all on it. And Joe's like, yo, my man, Max, you got to talk to Armante. He's cool. Uh, one of my coaches, I really rock with him. And then here we are a couple months later, man. So I'm glad we were able to stay in touch. Absolutely. Um, so I've, one, I'm really digging the uh, the sweatshirt there. That's that's smooth, man. That's Little retro cool. temple throwback with the cursive. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Is that uh, is that just for the the soccer coaches, or do you do you have to special order that Not one? A, yeah, the player. No, the players got this one too. So Ooh. this was uh, part of the standard package. Um, obviously, we we went from Under Armour to Nike this year, so a couple of new goodies. That that came in with it and everything else. So it was good. I love it. So, all right, man. Well, let's kind of get, let's jump into it. All right. So, um, as I stated, like we, we don't really know each other. So as much as the podcast guests are going to, or li our listeners are going to be learning. So am I, man, but I've done a little bit of research. Um, so let's just kind of talk from the very beginning. Uh, talk to us a little about like where you're from growing up playing soccer, um, what was the landscape like? Who are some of your influences? Just kind of the whole nine. All right. No, I grew up in North Florida, the uh, Panhandle area. All right. Uh, Tallahassee, Florida, to be exact. Um, but definitely, I was more, I grew up more in the rural area of Tallahassee, outside the city limits. You know, I was a, when my, when my teammates talked about, they live on the east side of town or south side, you know, Armante, where do you live? I, I live in the country, you know. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of riding bikes on dirt roads, a lot of, uh, playing outside barefoot all day and uh, summertime and your mom, you know, telling you to stay outside all day and not come in until it's lunch or dinner and you better not get in trouble. Right. So, yeah. Uh, so definitely always busy, um, was a pretty, uh, mischievous kid. Uh, so, some would say uh, you were bad, right. If you're mischievous, right. Depends on who um, you ask though. Exactly. Depends on who you ask. Exactly. Um, but I was always a busy kid. So my parents got me in athletics very early. Um, so it wasn't just soccer, you know, I played football, basketball, track, Basically, whatever sport was in season, you know, whatever my parents put me in to keep me busy, uh, yeah. keep me occupied, uh, that was a big piece of it. But um, the overall landscape in Tallahassee, it, it is what it is. Tallahassee and ultimately the rest of the South is football country, right? Yeah, that's um, what I was going to ask. So I naturally played football and had my time in football as well. But uh, from a soccer standpoint, you know, there's definitely those terms. Uh, I even used it as motivation in high school um, when I was playing football, track and soccer, you know, and your friends and, and some coaches on the football team, you know, you're playing a white sport, you know what I mean? And ultimately, what does that mean in the world's most popular sport and right. diverse right. sport in the world, right? So um, overall, I was always pretty much the only black player on my team in Tallahassee, Florida. Mm -hmm. um, but having the opportunities to guest play with teams in Atlanta, Concord, or guest play with Black Watch in Tampa or Doral in Miami, um, I got to see the, the different aspect of just the, the diversity as a whole um, when right. you're dealing with state of Florida uh, when you really start heading more south and the different demographics and second generation players and all that so and um, and I was going to ask so Florida I mean and correct me if I'm wrong because I'm, I'm in the middle of the country now in KC but has a, a pretty strong uh, Hispanic and Spanish population yeah. so when you were playing right you're, you mentioned you're the only one of the only black players on your team was mm -hmm. it mostly Hispanic or was it still uh, I mean, mostly white, and then you just had your Hispanic-like teams or, you know, what what was that like? It was definitely um, more based on where you were in Florida, right? Uh, we right. were in Region D in North Florida. It was very much so, <laughs> um, you know, you had a lot more white players and then a couple of African-American players, and then you really start to hit Tampa, Orlando, and go, so and go more south. Uh, not only did you have, you know, a lot of second-generation Mexican players, Brazilian, Venezuelan, Colombian, you also have the second generation Caribbean players. Yeah. You had 
Jamaicans, Haitians. Yeah, yeah, Haitians, yeah, so, yeah. Second generation Trinidadian. So yep. uh, th th there's a different kind of flair that you see when you're guest playing or playing against these teams from other places where, you know, really early on, I use I always go back to a phrase really early on in my soccer career. Um, you know, I had a, I, I started as an outside back uh, before I moved higher up the field, but um, one of my coaches back then was just a parent and it was when in doubt, kick it out. Yep. <laughs> uh, yep. Uh, as an outside back, but when I would go guest play for Black Watch, you know, we'd play scrimmages where it was two touch in between the eight teams. And a player like myself, who was, I was athletic, I was left footed, I was good 1v1, to have to start to think and play two touch in between, you know, ultimately the bigger portion of the field in between mm -hmm. the lines, um, it made you grow as a player. You, you grasped onto that and, and seeing better players around you as well. So, I think guest playing as a youth player definitely helped me in my development just as much as playing with my my local team. Yeah. Okay. And before we move on, right, we I want to talk about the coaching because we're both coaches. Um, I'm, you know, we all have our own reasons for getting into it. Uh, but when you were playing, did you have a black coach? Did you have someone that you? I'm not going to say you looked up to, but someone that you could relate to in that way. Let's start with soccer and then let's talk with any sport and every sport you played. Well, when I think about it, I, I had a black coach in every sport except soccer, <laughs> right? Uh, so football, basketball, track, baseball, even. Um, yeah. You know, and I think the only black coach I had in baseball, his son was the pitcher who was also the quarterback in football. So that kind of went hand in hand, right? Um, but soccer, I did not have a black coach to ultimately latch on to we the closest I got to a black coach was a local when indoor soccer was still being played in Tallahassee mm -hmm. um, Chris Holland was a local player for that team okay he, he came and ran sessions with us every now and again back then I think it was just to make extra money um, right, right. but mm -hmm. looking back I pulled a lot from him naturally just gravitating towards a player or a player that was still a pro and he looked like me mm -hmm. and while he wasn't my coach uh, I do remember vividly uh, the two years he was coming out to trainings I grasped on to to what made him a better player and just his understanding of the game and his knowledge of the game for sure. Um, yeah. Overall, never had any black coaches uh, in soccer. Okay. Now, when you were, you, you, you graduated, right? Played in mm -hmm. high school. I know you played multiple sports. You ran track, um, mm -hmm. soccer, any, any other sports in high school? Uh, high school, I, I started trimming all the sports by the time I got to high school. But my <clears> high school, it was just football, which led into soccer season, which led into track season. So okay. I did all three, and then I stopped playing football uh, going into my junior year. Um, okay. started really, I started getting letters for soccer, and I was like, this is really uh, what I'm going to put all my time and energy into from there. So Yeah, and freshman year, you, you attended Stetson. I was, I was reading up on this, and you were, I mean, balling out your freshman year so much so that then you transferred to to USF. So mm -hmm. you stayed in the, the state of Florida. Um, at first, I, I did not know where Stetson was, but then as I started reading more, I was like, okay, in Florida. So how was your time in college at both universities? Um, what was that landscape like? Were you still one of the only Black people? Was there a change when you went from Stetson to USF? Mm -hmm. um, when you started getting that, those uh, all tournament and all conference recognition, right? For, I think, was it Stetson, you scored like the game winning goal to take the team? The final. Uh, to the, yeah. yeah, to the final. Yeah. So yeah. you obviously weren't a scrub. Um, it comes attention with that. Just kind of talk to me about your time playing in, in college. Um, overall, I mean, just being a student athlete in general, I mean, it was a fantastic experience, right? Yeah. Um, I think being a college student in general, it, it's a great experience. You're going to make bonds and connections that are, that are going to last you the rest of your life. But adding in the extra element of, of being a student athlete, I mean, I remember vividly getting recruited to join frats and join this bro these brotherhoods. And and I was like, I'm already a part of two. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm on a track team and a, and a soccer team in a locker room that's tight knit and it's a lifelong brotherhood. So I'm already, right. I saw it I'm as chilling. a frat. Yeah. Um, Overall, my experience at both was good. It was definitely different. Um, Stetson is a it's two thousand students. Um, it's a private school, uh, so with that, things I didn't really put in perspective. I mean, I went there because I got a very good scholarship where my parents didn't have to to come out of pocket that much financially, and it made it financially feasible for a lower middle class family to afford a school that was back then about thirty five thousand a year, and they're up to about fifty five thousand a year now. I think. Um, 
but yes, but um you know at Stetson I, I I was I had two black teammates at Stetson but it was a private school field there was definitely more you know you're more American based kids on the roster um mm -hmm. looking at the dynamics of, of recruiting and, and college and being at JU which was a private school um you realize there's a lot of good players that you can give a 30 you can give a thirty thousand dollar or twenty thousand dollar scholarship to in a private school setting but say they don't get academic aid they still have to pay out of pocket from the school yeah. and it's easier for them cheaper for them to go to ucf or florida gulf coast as a walk-on yeah so we valued them more but it was still uh cheaper for them to go to another school but stetson in general um you know i i remember seeing a ferrari outside the cafeteria on the second day of school um, I, I just found myself really uncomfortable all of a sudden, um, just being around people who were from a demographic that just wasn't what I was used to, but used to, yeah. um, overall on the field, I had a fantastic time. Um, you talk about relationships, my senior captain at Stetson, I ended up working with at Jacksonville university. He's the head coach there now, Mauricio Ruiz. Okay. Um, so I made a lot of lifelong bonds there. I obviously want to, the only, well, the first conference championship in school history, got, got to go to the tournament my first year. So. Um, at Stetson, it was a very positive three semesters there, but wanting to continue to challenge myself, I transferred to USF, uh, which was part of the old Big East. And um, while I only had two black teammates at, at Stetson, uh, you talk about uh, Florida in a super diverse area. I mean, we ha probably had 12 or 14 teammates of color. And, and by of color, I just mean African American or Jamaican or Trinidadian, you know, right. teammates from Accra, Ghana. So, um, the locker room dynamic changed immensely. For sure. Uh, when I went to to USF, the style of play was a lot more up tempo, and I had to I had to stay after a little bit more to to adapt my style of play to get the most out of myself. Yep. Um, but my experience at USF was completely different, right? We went from two thousand students to forty thousand. Uh, you know, you went from a hundred hundred people at your games to two two three thousand people at your game. So yeah, um, you had the football experience or the traditional college feel. So right, um, I had the best of both worlds during my experience, and and ultimately I, I wouldn't change it for the world. So that's awesome. So you finished playing, and then you made that transition into coaching, right? And and you started at USF, uh, <laughs> if I read that right, as your first coaching gig. So mm -hmm. I kind of alluded to it earlier, but we all, we all have our own reasons for getting into it. What was your reason? When, when did it hit you? Did you always know you wanted to coach or was it at the end of the season? Maybe you're like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm don't want to play anymore, but I still want to be connected. I don't want to go into corporate America. So I need to figure out this. Like what, what was your thought process with doing it and why at USF yeah. at first? Um, well, first off, look, looking back, I, I probably have to thank my parents for me being a coach because because one, my mom always told me she was like, You're, you'd be a good teacher. And I'd always say I'm not going to be a teacher. But yep. Yep. Go figure. I'm a teacher on the field. Right. Right. Uh, but upon getting my degree, you know, I graduated in 2010. That was right around the time the market kind of crashed, was recovering. And, and a lot of jobs were, you know, jobs coming out of, with a bachelor's degree wasn't really um, it was pretty hard to get, you know, good yeah. jobs coming out in that time. Um, and my parents were very adamant. They were like, you have your degree, but if you move back home, you're still going to pay rent. Like we didn't, we didn't send you to school to, to come back and just live rent free. And, right. and of course, looking back, they were still in me, instilling in me just the responsibilities of, of becoming a man and, and finding my way. And because of that, I stayed in Tampa. Um, my first job in a, with a communications degree at, at a USF was as a telemarketer, um, wearing a suit and tie in a cubicle every day, getting cussed out on the phone for calling yep. people. Yep. Um, and it was that, that, you know, I got, I started getting to a point where I was making decent money, but I, I genuinely didn't enjoy just going to work every day. Um, mm -hmm. I was paying bills, but um, that ultimately led to George Kiefer, who was my coach at USF, uh, is the current coach at NC State, um, just to get more money to, to help with rent. He started allowing me to, to videotape the home games as an alum, and he paid me, you know, $75 a game, nothing crazy, yeah. uh, just your money in my pocket, and all of a sudden, all the extra time I had, I found myself at the facility and seeing right. how, they, how they run the program and seeing this program I played for and seeing how, you know, what goes into a, to schedule or putting together a training session, seeing what goes into recruiting, seeing what goes into the whole setup of, of being a college coach. And the more and more I was around there, it was like, I would absolutely love to do this for a living. You know, you're around the game. 
uh, being a competitive person, <laughs> really, um, are going to find ways to evolve and, and become a better coach. So um, overall, the transition, the transition into coaching was really because I got to a point really early at a, at a college where I just identified that if I'm going to work, I at least want to enjoy what I'm doing. doing. And even though I took a pay cut, I looked at it as an internship uh, when I was really as a volunteer role director of ops. And right. I, just, I attacked that like it's the job I want to do. And I was there earlier than the head coach, there earlier than the assistants. And I put everything into it and it's kind of evolved into to where I am today. So it's, it's, it's been good. I, you brought up something that, that was funny because you're not the first person to say it um, on this season. And it happened to me as well. So senior year, I didn't have a job yet. Right. I, I didn't graduate yet, but I'm going to the end of it. Mm -hmm. I very vividly remember talking to my mom and she's saying, you know, if you don't get a job, you're moving back home here with me and you're going to have to pay rent. And I was <laughs> like, no, sir, I will not be doing that. Yeah. I applied to like 20 jobs that mm -hmm. next day. I was like, I'm not doing this. Not, <laughs> not going to do it. I'm going to figure this out. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that, I mean, that pushed me because I was like, I'm not moving back home. I didn't go to college to get a degree to, to then back. move back home and pay, you know, live rent free. Right. That I got away so I could try to become a man. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so I thought that was, that was interesting. And, and I think that's dope, you know, your your old uh, coach letting you come back and just being a part of it. And and you realize you weren't happy in life. And and this is something I tell all the kids I coach. I'm such I'm such a big uh, believer in this, but you got to do what you love every day. Like if you don't, I mean, that's a miserable life. Like yeah. I, yeah. I couldn't imagine I was, you know, I was an engineer and I did that for three years in an office. I didn't hate my life every day. I won't say that, but I didn't love it yeah. by, by any means. I enjoyed going to high school practice right after work and then going to club practice after that and then getting home at 10 p.m., going straight to bed and then waking up at 6 a.m. just to do the whole thing over again. Yeah. And I was like, coaching is, is it. You know, it didn't pay the bills at first, but now, you know, I'm like, I'd get to do what I love. I'm coaching. It's now starting to put some some bills on or pay some bills. And more importantly, I'm happy every day. Like no matter what, mm. the only thing I had to do today was this podcast. Like this is work. Yep. And I mean, that's, when, you, when you enjoy what you're doing, it's not really work, is it? No, I'm oh. like, man, I get to talk to somebody for an hour. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> uh, so, all right. So, when you when you got to USF, right? You, you said you started off as the home as the home game video recorder, mm -hmm. turned into you said director of ops, and and then I I read that you were you were very instrumental in the development of players, and mm -hmm. and before we get into that, one thing that I always hear when it comes to professional managers is you either are a developer or talent or you are a manager of talent, meaning yep. that you can either make someone that's raw, mm -hmm. phenomenal, or you can take all these phenomenal people and egos and know how to make them all mesh. Yep. So do you believe that you're a talent developer over the manager part? And then talk to us about how do you connect with those players? What, cause it, you have to know them. They have yep. to trust and respect you. What do you do to get them to do that? Are you a student? that's struggling a little bit with the hybrid and virtual learning and looking to get just a little more help academically? Or are you a parent that has a child who's struggling to keep that same level of discipline and rigor that they had in the classroom at home? If any of these apply to you, check out No Stress Midwest Education, an academic tutoring service where we offer both in-person and virtual tutoring. One of the things that separates us from others is that all of our tutors are board certified educators in Kansas and Missouri in a variety of specialty topics and familiar with the latest curriculum in school districts around the metro area. We are passionate about helping students achieve their goals in the classroom and also committed to helping students build the necessary skills and tools they will need in the future to succeed on their own. Our team follows the latest guidelines from the CDC. We require masks for all in-person tutoring to protect both the student and the tutor. 
Our tutors will either travel to your home or meet at a predetermined location to conduct all in-person tutoring sessions. All we need is a space for learning and we're ready to go. At No Stress Midwest, we truly believe in developing the well-rounded student athlete. No Stress Midwest does not tell you what to think, but teaches you how to think. No Stress Midwest Education, an academic tutoring service. For more information, visit www.nostressmidwest.com backslash education. Um, well, starting with the, I think you can be both, right? I think when you, yeah. when, you when you get naturally talented players, um, I feel like once you get those players, especially players that want to play at the next level, uh, once you get them to understand that it's not how talented they are, it's the consistency of how that talent is, you know, produced on a day-to-day -day basis and, and mm -hmm. continuing to always find room to get better. Um, I think when you get the talented players to really latch onto that, um, it's super important. And I, I also look back at, you know, as a recruiter, just identifying how big our country is and how many players fall through the cracks. Yeah. Um, I would say it's just as rewarding when you, when you get a Jamaican or U S national team player to come to your university and, and they're able to become a pro and, and, you know, make money playing a child's game after that. It's just as rewarding as getting a player from the club level um, who, who wasn't heavily recruited, who you saw, uh, he had qualities that would ultimately um, transition to the next level. Uh, when you see that player also develop and, and latch on to, to the understanding of what you want to do as a, as a program and your style of play, and they latch on to that opportunity um, and take advantage of it. Um, I feel like that's just as rewarding as, as moving on, you know, a player that's just extremely talented. So um, right. I feel like you can cover both of those aspects as a coach um, when you're bringing players in, but, um, really, when, when I look at players that I'm bringing in, starting from the recruiting process, you know, whether it's the recruiting process, uh, me playing at a high level in Division One, me being able to coach at the Division One level for now a decade, mm -hmm. um, just being able to relate to them and, and share with them my personal experiences, you know, starting with the recruiting process, how I went through it, understanding the questions that they have and trying to make it as transparent as possible to getting on campus and, and telling a player who wants to be a pro, Yes, you're, you're talented, but are you a nine today and a two tomorrow, or are you a solid six every time? Right. About a professional general manager, you know, or MLS or USL general manager taking a chance on you. Um, they want a player that they know what they're going to get out of them every time. And it's not just you being a pro on the field, it's you being a pro in everything else. Yep. So um, I think it's also you can't skip out on the fact that you're just continuing to help develop people too, just as well as the players that they are. I feel like that's the one of the main reasons I enjoy what I do so much because I look back at, you know, being an 18, 19 year old kid away from my family and, you know, how big, how big an influence that my coaches had on me as a player away right. from their parents. You know, you look at uh, Brahim Hancock, who was a, who was a huge mentor of mine still to this day, who's a head coach at Texas Reboa Shoney, uh, who's the head coach at Dartmouth, Ryan Anatol, that's the head coach at Stony Brook. All these guys were my assistant coaches during my time as a player and, and they helped me become a better player, but uh, I really value the fact that they, they sh showed they showed faith in me and cared about me as a person as well. And, and I feel like they got everything that I had to offer because I knew in the end, even when they're hard on me, uh, they, they ultimately cared about my development as a human being. Uh, and yeah. it wasn't just about what I did on the field. Obviously that matters, but- But off like the field. Had everything in, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and two things, so, as, as, a, as a high school coach, right, I'm, I'm at the point where I have kids that I don't control who like who comes to my school, at least. Um, and not all of them play at the next level. Not all of them want to play at the next level. Mm -hmm. So for me, I, I, I put a very heavy emphasis on I'm trying to make them better people off the field because majority of the kids I coach don't go on to play. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure the lessons that I, I try to teach them, they can carry on to some aspect. So for you, what you, you mentioned that you do that as well. Um, you also mentioned being a professional on the field and off the field. Mm -hmm. What are some of those things that being a professional off the field entails, right? For the, the kids that are listening that want to play in college and yeah. that want to play pro, what does it mean to be 
a professional off the field? Does it mean you're on social media taking pictures with as many cute girls or guys as you can, or that you're always trying to be in the know or what, what does that mean? I, I just think it, you know, obviously you get kids who are basically they're coming to school to play, to play the game, right. To play soccer, yeah. coming to temple to play soccer. But um, even if you are, you know, even in the classroom, you're either a sharp student or you're a hardworking student. Like the, you get a lot of kids that come in and say, coach, I'm just a bad student. No, you're not. Right. Uh, you're either a hardworking student or you're a sharp student that it comes a little bit more natural to. Uh, so just making sure you're, you're taking care of your academics and, and, and making sure you're on time to your tutoring and, and making sure everything's in line academically so we can get the most out of you on the field. And, you know, we're not getting to a point where you have a great performance, but the next day we're getting an email from two professors and you're not representing yourself or the program professionally uh, off the field um, or even going into your nutrition, right? Right. Um, kids come in and they want to be pros and, and it's like, what you put in your body is exactly what you're going to get out of it in the long term as well. When your metabolism slows down, you're talking about being a pro, not just making it there, but sustaining that level and, and staying Being there. Yeah. Staying there. Like these are, these are things that all come into play. And um, I, I talk <clears> to <throat> players all the time. It's, it's quietly something I've started to notice. I, most, the majority of players that I've been fortunate enough to coach that have been able to make it to the next level, um, something as simple as their locker being tidy. Like there's not just clothes everywhere. There's not shoes everywhere, hanging everywhere. It's a, it's a neat space mm -hmm. a space where they're, they're there before practicing enough time to look after that space. And everything just aligns uh, with you treating everything professionally and, and, and holding yourself to a standard in everything that you do. So that's yeah. what I mean by being professional and, and everything. Uh, okay. All, all the yeah, no, I, I like that. And, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in the discipline as well as, as a manager and, you know, I, we have like numbered bags, right. That our players get. So I make it when they show up to training, all the bags have to be lined up in numerical order. Mm -hmm. They, all their stuff needs to be inside of that bag. There's no clothes hanging out, you know? And like you said, little things like that, you know, sure. They're like, Oh my God, coach, this is so stupid. It's just a bag, but it's, it's like, kid. but it's not just a bag. It's, yeah. it's a bigger picture than that. Um, and I think we have, as, as coaches, we're in a very, cool place that we get to help build and develop players, but we get to help build and develop people, mm -hmm. right? In the next generation that's going to take over this country and this world, mm -hmm. we're a part of that. Um, so I, I think it's, it's, it's pretty cool that, that we're in that position. Um, so you talked about with the development of talent, right? Now I mentioned how we met was from Joe uh, Miko, who's someone you, you coach, uh, I just saw Dom Dwyer also with someone there, another one of my buddies. Um, so what what was it with these people? And there are a, few, a, a certain uh, few others that have played on at the USL or MLS level that you're connected to. But what was it with these people maybe that made them stand out more? Was it that they just worked harder than everyone else? Was it that they were just more professional than everyone else? Um are there certain things that you can kind of see now that you've been in the game for over a decade that you can say, ah, he's, he's got it. He's got it. I can tell. Talk me through that. Yeah. I, I think it goes both ways. Cause a guy like Dom Dwyer, um, the intensity of how he trained every day, lets you know, he was different. Mm -hmm. um, and he was a goal scorer. So he found a way to just be in the spots to score goals. But um, whether we won a game or lost a game, Dom Dwyer was, he, he emptied his tank every single day and he was the best player on the team. Yeah. So from a team aspect, when your best player is the hardest working player in training and, and they're the most talented player, it, it spreads throughout the team uh, That's naturally. Uh, yeah. naturally. Um, and then a guy like Joe, I think Joe was always very, very talented. Uh, once again, I think, um, I've been doing it long enough to know that this, the, the saddest thing in the world is wasted talent. And there's a lot of it, right? Um, but Joe was a player that had all the talent in the world. And he was a guy that we really, really harped on him. Once again, our, on a scale of one to 10, you were, you were an eight this game, but the next day in training, you're operating at a three or a four. Right. Um, and that's when Joe was a sophomore. And I think Joe really did a good job in his last two or, or his last, his junior and senior year. Um, just coming in and operating at a at an intensity level and and 
handling himself at, as far as on the field professionally um, every single day and making it a priority mm. to, to leave training saying, you know, he was one of the top players in training every day. I think that was Joe's thing where he could get away with being one of the better players, but are you operating at a level that is going to be able to sustain that and, and continue to, to help you grow as a player um, right. and ultimately keep you on track to, to where you want to be? You know, are you okay with having a bad day of practice? And I think once he really focused on the fact that I got to come here every day and be the best player here, even if I'm an outside back, mm -hmm. um, you started to see him and his stock skyrocket. Um, obviously, it, it went right into his performances uh, right. in, the, in his last year. So um, I think overall, um, a lot of the things that those guys have in common is just the, the intensity and the understanding of how they operate on a daily basis um, and not letting not letting days go wasted um, as right. far as training um, and the training environment. Yeah. There's, there's a quote that says like being successful is, is not something you do once, but something you have to do every day. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you kind of touched on that point, right? It's if you have one good day, well, that's cool. But what do you do the next three, four days? Mm -hmm. Is it, are you consistently inconsistent or are you inconsistently consistent? You know, like, if we get one good game out of four, or do we just get maybe four solid oh, games okay. out of you know out of you? And and every coach is going to say, hey, I'd rather be solid, so I know what to expect. Mm -hmm. I know that I'm going to get this every day. But if one day you net three goals, right? And I don't think any coach is going to be upset at that. But then the following day, you're just standing there and you, you barely have you know any touches. Then then it's like, come on, man. Backwards. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Um, so, all right. So after, after USF, you were at Jacksonville, Jacksonville for a bit as a recruiting coordinator. Um, and then you kind of moved into your current role now at Temple uh, as a recruiting coordinator. Did, did I miss, did I miss any, any schools oh, that, there? Yeah. That was no. it. All right. So why recruiting coordinator at, and how, how kind of that role and I know that in the college game, they say that you are only as good as you're recruiting. So you obviously play a very big role in the success of these programs. So what, what is it that goes into it? You know, what are you looking at? How many highlight reels do you get sent today? What, you know, just kind of fill us in on that stuff. All right, yeah, no, I think um, re recruiting is, it is, it's the lifeblood of any program. Um, Styles aside, um, personnel aside, I think being able to get talented players in that can go onto a field and, and you know, basically stay in line with the coach's game plan and, and unravel teams and show quality on the field, um, it does come to getting high-level players in um, overall. But um, I think from a recruiting standpoint, you're really just identifying guys that not so much are talented, but that also fit your, your model and your style and your values as a program. Mm -hmm. um, you know, looking at they're, they're super talented players, but if they don't fit how you play or, you know, we're a team that we like to play a possession oriented style, but we also like to press for 90 minutes. Um, so, you know, I, I reference outside backs now, you know, you get a lot of emails from outside backs that are like, coach, you know, I, I had six goals and third assists from outside back. And the highlight video is mainly them whipping balls in, getting forward. But I'm like, where's the defensive clips? Right. You know, right. Uh, you, can you defend, what kind uh, of can you defend? Can you defend? Uh, yeah. Um, but looking at that, I think obviously over the landscape of, of the dead period the last year, um, been asking for a lot more game film yeah. than highlights. I think in a, in a normal year uh, where there's some normalcy, um, you know, you're looking at highlight videos to catch your interest. Right. Uh, but ultimately, it comes down to going to see that player in a game. Um, I am. I was fortunate enough to be at JU where you had to think a little bit more outside the box and in the name of recruiting, had, had to make sure you got it right um, when you were spending money on players because we weren't a fully funded program. Okay. Um, so I would go to, let's say, a big showcase like Disney Showcase, and I would see a player that I like. But naturally at Disney, when there's 300 teams and there's 4,000 college coaches there, when you're on a club team and everybody on your club team is the is the best players in that club, it's naturally going to make it easier for you as a player to show your quality. But it's also when you're in that environment and you see a hundred coaches lined up on the sideline, you're going to be a good teammate. You're going to be right. You're right. Good, yeah. Good point. Good, point. good point. One of my favorite things to do was to identify a player with this club team 
And then I would I would show up to his high school, a random high school game on a Tuesday in, in civilian clothes. Yeah. No, no JU gear, no temple gear. And I want to see how you act in a high school environment when your teacher may not be a soccer or when your coach may not be a soccer guy. Mm-hmm. It may be the, the science teacher or your if even if you have a, a, a coach who's a soccer guy, you have teammates who aren't at the level aren't, yep. of your club team. How do you act in that environment? Are you operating the same way? Are you still showing your quality in that environment? Yeah. Um, I, I kind of get a kick out of, out of doing that because it is. It's not just about talent. It's about the intangibles. You know, what kind yeah. of team are you? Um, you know, and, and how different, how, how often do they flip the switch from it's that big, that big stage? It's a lot more to, than you think. Yeah. You yeah. Know, players that are captains of their club team and they're the captain of their high school team. But in high school, for their club team, they're defensive center mid. But for the high school team, they're probably one of the best players, if not the best player. So the coach moves the kid to center back for the mm-hmm. game. And when he moves to center back, the kid walks off the field and says, I'm not playing center back. Right. Well, that, that's a bad character trait. Yeah. And you're showing me who you truly are right now. Yeah. Uh, in, in a game where, especially as we play, you're naturally going to find yourself in different pockets on the field. As a six, you're going to be asked to drop in between the center backs to create overloads. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you're naturally going to be in different spaces that will positionally – would be another position, but naturally in the flow of the game, uh, you're going to have to be versatile and good in yeah. tight spaces. So uh, overall, I think, um, you know, recruiting and, and looking at the amount of emails we got from before the pandemic into now, it's completely, it's, it's basically double, triple, tenfold. I would right. say I got an average of about 100, 150 emails a day um, before the pandemic, but after the pandemic, it's probably more around 200, 250. Um, and that's per day. And I, we do our darndest. I do my darndest to, to go through everyone. I, and literally yeah. now, since we can't recruit, I, I literally put out a day where I'm just watching game film and I'm just chipping away. You're always catching up with the emails. Right. But I feel like you have to just just do your due diligence to all these players that are reaching out. Like you may not reach back out or respond to all of them, but I can at least go look at the film that's there. Yeah. Uh, especially in a time now where we can't recruit in person. So. Right. Um, so yeah, you, you get a lot of emails. As a that's, that's crazy. I, Are you I, ready I, to take your game to the next level? Trust the process and sign up for No Stress Midwest training today at www.nostressmidwest.com slash training. No Stress Midwest primarily offers training for soccer players on the individual, group, and team settings of all ages and skill sets. Our training is customized for the player And our goal in doing that is to continue to grow the love of the game, build a personal desire to want to develop, and create the chance and choice for the player to play at the next level. We have developed a unique solution here at No Stress Midwest Training, showing our clients that you can have fun while still getting better. By creating a unique training environment customized to the player, we feel that not only are we able to get the most out of the individual by creating a no-stress environment, but we are also teaching them fundamentals that they can carry off the field and apply in their everyday life. Visit our website at www.nostressmidwest.com backslash training and sign up for your first session today. I was uh, down at, at KU. They have just the women's program, um, and and I was befriended their coach. And I was down there last fall, not the fall that just passed, so twenty twenty, I think. Okay. And um, talking to their assistant coaches and just hearing, you know, how many highlight videos they're getting. He's telling me he's getting about a hundred, a hundred and fifty highlight videos a day on like a slow time. Mm-hmm. And for me, I like like you. I'm just like, how in the world are you going through all those emails? Always playing catch up. Yeah, up. man, I get anxiety when now my text messages. I have a lot of unread text, but emails, I yeah. get anxiety when that's when that's out of control. I've got to <laughs> know all of my unread emails. I get notified when I get an email, but I, I had to turn the actual notification sound off because it'd be going off every. All the t- you know, if you're getting 150 a day, 200, 300, I mean, yeah. geez, there's no social life. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right, so what's the what's the coaching like as far as diversity? Not at Temple, but just 
in all of your 10 years plus that you've been coaching, have you found or seen many black assistant coaches, black head coaches at the division one level? Um, I've read some, some stats and I think it's like a 3% of NCAA coaches are black three point, like it's 3.8 summers, you know, so whatever, but it's not high. So what's your experience been like? Have you seen many? Have you seen a lot? Do you, people ask you, when are you going to be a head coach? You know, what, what's up? Um, yeah, no, there's definitely um, a difference across obviously the demographics of, of NCAA division one coaching. Um, I think there's 204, 205, uh, NCAA Division One programs, and there's there's ten black coaches. Um, and you, yeah, you know that number. Yeah, because, I know yeah, that number. Yeah, you know that. I know that number. Um, my buddy Trevor Banks just became the head coach at uh, Chicago State, and yeah, I know Trevor. Yeah, yeah I know Trevor. Uh, That's dope. I congratulated him, and shortly after, it was a text. Uh, when are you going to be number eleven? Right. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but it is. It's it's one of those things. Um, even looking at when the American was ten teams back when it was ten teams, and I was on staff at USF. It was me, Brahim Hancock, uh, on staff at USF. And then I think in our conference, there was maybe, I think there was three other black coaches um, during my time at JU and the Atlantic Sun. There was myself and Henry Appaloo at Florida Gulf Coast were the only two um, black assistants. And then even now in the American, which is six teams now, um, it's me and the assistant coach at Memphis Norris. So we're the only black assistant or head coaches. And what's... Um, and to me, I'm going to let you finish real quick, but you know all of their names. So I, I that's... Yeah. I'm not going to say that's a problem. No. But that's, I mean. No, you, 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 you make it a point to know as well. Yeah, right? exactly. You make, you make it a point to know. I think uh, looking back to when we were still able to recruit, right, um, it, it's, it's a running joke. Not a running joke, but uh, you naturally, like I naturally, when I see a black coach that I haven't seen before, I 100% I'm going to go say hello. Mm -hmm. um, naturally. Um and I've had acquaintances and buddies who are, who are white, kind of, you know, it's me. And I remember standing on the sideline with Boa Shoney, head coach at Dartmouth, Ryan Anatol, head coach at Stony Brook, and Brahim, head coach at Radford that just became head coach at Texas Rio Grande. Okay. Um, I remember standing there and, and there was a white person that came up and, and he's like, uh, is it okay if I stand over here? And it was like, and he, and he, and he knew all of us, so it was, it was banter. But at right, the same right. Time, I was like, so look at every other field. Is it okay if I go stand at, at that field with a right, exactly. white coaches? Like, why is it, it's not the other way around, but when yep. you see four black coaches standing together, that came up. So it, right. it is something that is, I think is known. Um, I, I tend to, it's a fine line, I think, knowing that there's a lot of black coaches that can do a very good job at this level, but it's also like, they're not a, they're not a good black coach or African-American coach. They're just good coaches that would be successful. That would be successful. Exactly. Given this, given this opportunity. So, man, I, I keep saying that. I keep saying that it's, if you're a good coach, you're a good coach, whether you're black, white, Asian, gay, straight, whatever, if you can coach the game and the kids rock with you or the, the, your, t your players rock with you, you're a good coach and it shouldn't be, Oh, we need this many, this, this many, that like, I, I think the great coaches are the ones that just need to step up now and, and, yeah. and fill those roles. You step in it, don't drop the ball, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you fill in, right, you're, you'll be number 11. I'm, I'm going to speak it into existence. <laughs> but, but when you step into that role, everyone that wants to be a college coach of, uh, as, a, as a black person, is you're, you're part of it. So yeah. if you mess up here, ah, man, well, we took a chance on Armante, man, and he just, he was not it. And it's funny that you, oh, sorry to cut you off. It's no, no, you're good. That, you're good. That you mentioned it in that aspect, because I've been fortunate enough looking back. I've been in college coaching 10 years, and, and all 10 years have been at the Division One level. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's been a grind to get to where I'm at, but I've also met coaches along the way who started at a JUCO in North Dakota, and they moved to a D3 in Utah, and then they moved to NAI in Texas, and and they finally got a breakthrough to Division One yep. uh, as an assistant. Um, the one person I'm thinking of in, in particular, but um, looking at the the want to be a head coach, I think I'm fortunate enough to be in a Division One environment where I think looking at Division One coaching jobs from a basketball football standpoint, everybody sees that D1 job because the the difference in pay is millions of dollars. Right. But Division One, Division Two coaches, I mean, I know t I can name 
five to 10 division two coaches that are making more money than 70, 80% of the division one coaches out there, you know, uh, but in saying that looking at the division, being a division one coach and being a black division one coach, I think it's also being in a situation where I think I've been fortunate enough to, to get to this point in my career where I can take a step back and say, you know, when I am looking at a head coaching job, is it just that I want to be a division one head coach or is it that I want to be a division one head coach in a place where I'm going to enjoy the quality of life. If the I'm right thing, yeah. uh, but mainly um, as a coach, am, do I have the resources to be successful there? Mm -hmm. so, um, are exactly. you looking at a D1 job that has two scholarships and every other school in that conference has 9.9? Right. So uh, I'm not saying I won't look at schools that only have two or three scholarships, but I think I, I'm fortunate enough to be in a position to where if I'm looking at some, and I have looked at some head coaching jobs out there uh, that have opened up in the last year or two, um, but I think that's a big piece of it. It's, it's not a division three coach just saying there's a D one job open and I'm going to apply just to be, yep. Uh, yep. I've been fortunate enough to look at it from that perspective. Like this school has two scholarships and the AD is expecting you to win an at, to win a conference title in two or three years. Right. It's a, it's a tough gig regardless. Yep. Um, you know, so uh, and I think those things also go into, to when you're looking at being a head coach. And, and that's, that's big, right? And like you said, you're, you're in a position where you're fortunate enough to, you're not just trying to be a D1 head coach just to check it off your box, right? If you're going to do it, you want to be set up in a position to be successful. Um, and, and I think that's a very good point and uh, obviously very mature way of looking at it and a very top level way that, you know, sometimes it's not just about grabbing that lowest hanging fruit. Um, yeah. When you know that if you wait a little longer, you might be able to get one that's a little higher up, right? And yeah. and I, I think that's big, man. So either way, whenever that time comes, I'm I'm here rooting for you. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna make sure that wherever it is, I'm gonna tell all of my high school kids, "Yo, I know this coach. He's gonna hook you up." Uh, I'm gonna yes, yeah, so get myself in trouble with that. <laughs> um, but so, what's in the future for you? If not, and you know, when, whenever the head coaching job, whenever that time comes, what else is there? Is, is there any aspirations to maybe take it to uh, the professional ranks? Are you happy at the college level? Do you want to get to a, a certain college, right? Or a certain conference and be a head coach? What's kind of your future? Yeah. Once again, I think you're obviously um, attracted by the, the big, the big, brands out there, you know, your, your bigger logos and your power five conferences, so to speak. But I think um, I absolutely want to be a head coach at, at the division one level um, and the NCAA level in the very near future, mm -hmm. um, but more so reeling, reeling it back into where we are now, um, especially in these uncertain times with COVID. I think my main goal right now is to do our best to, to continue to progress as a program here at Temple and, and really push the fold. Um, yeah. We ended the we ended in the top. I believe we were 36th in the RPI last year. Just missed out on Temple's first um, at large NCAA tournament bid in about in over 30 years. Um, so I think we're really close here at Temple to doing something very special. And for the for the time being, um, I think all my eggs are really into this basket at Temple and making sure we're getting the most out of this opportunity as a staff and and as far as the, the players that we have here as well, knowing that. Being a part of NCAA tournament teams as a player and coach, myself, Coach Roland, Coach Shinsky, we are fortunate enough to know what that looks like, and we feel yeah. like we have that here, and we're on the cusp of doing something uh, really special. But absolutely long term, um, when that time comes, I think any head coach uh, that becomes a head coach, it was kind of a thing that just happened. You know, a job opened and they went in for it, and it happened really quick. Yeah. Um, so, so I, I think work. You know chipping away at my coaching philosophy and, and everything for when that time comes, I think I'm in a good place when I am ready to step out on, on, on that, on faith in that, in that regard and, and put myself in, in regards to in the environment to run a program, should I say? Yeah. Um, but for the time being right now, I think uh, it's really just putting everything into getting the most out of our opportunity right now at Temple. At Temple yeah. Well, and, and you, you brought up like when you become a head coach, it, it, the opportunity just kind of happens, you know, and, I know, and I'm, I'm not on the college level yet, but I was an assistant coach at a, at a high school here and I was very content. I just was, I was a varsity assistant, just was named JV head coach. I was getting paid after four years of not getting paid to do it. So I just remember like, I'm like, man, I'm winning state championships. Like I'm chilling. 
Yep. And I had a club parent, I coached club as well. And a parent emailed me, it was like, Hey, this high school's the head coaching job just opened up. Would you be interested? And I'm like, nah, I'm not trying to go to that school, man. They're not that good. I'm here. I'm, I'm collecting my state championships, man. <laughs> and then someone else sent me the same job rec and they were like, there's someone in the soccer world who I, I respected. And he was like, yo, you need to apply for this job. And I'm like, all right, man, I prayed on it. I applied for it at first, like just kind of half ass, like, you know, if I get it cool, if not, yeah. whatever. And I remember it, every day, it probably was like a month from when I applied to like, when I got the job, maybe a month and a half long. Okay. And every day that crept up, every day that went on after I applied, I wanted that job more and more. <laughs> and by the end of it, I was like, I'm going to be a head coach. This is what I'm supposed to do. Yep. I want this. And I just remember how great it felt when I finally had that, when I got it. And now being able to run a program, you know, like how you see fit. Um, it's awesome. So I really wish that for you. Uh, I won't rush it because if you're happy, I'm happy. But when the time does come, man, it's uh, I'm, I'm pulling for you with it. All right. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. All right. So before we before we wrap up here, I have to give a shout out to one of our podcast sponsors, AGY. Um, AGY Performance Training. If you're a soccer player in the Kansas City area, elite or pre elite, you've got next level goals. AGY Performance Training should be on your radar. Over a dozen MLS, NWSL, USL pros trust AGY to get them ready for the grind that is professional soccer. Find them on Instagram at AGY Performance Training. All right, Armante, we're back here. We're getting ready to wrap things up. Before we do, I just want to, well, two things I want to ask. First thing, is there any way that you can hook me up with one of those sweatshirts, man? Absolutely. I need oh your address goodness. tonight. I can have that out in, in a week. Dude, that that I, I've been staring at it. I was like, that's that's swag. And and I'm from New Jersey, South Jersey. So okay. I right. fly into the Philly airport. Um, my family on my mom's side, they all live in Philly, huge Temple fans. So when I come home for Christmas next year, rocking this good piece of merchandise. Hey, that's hey I, I just know people. <laughs> I don't know. I just know okay. people. Yeah, that, that that one's not in the bookstore. You can't get this one. Okay. Uh, that no, that thing's nice. <laughs> Um, so, all right, man, we're, we're getting ready to wrap up here. I just want to know, is there any final thoughts, any final words you want to get out? Maybe something you want to touch on any shout outs, anything you want to do before we wrap up here? Um, I, I would say if there's any younger players listening, um, go, just going back into the development of, of relating with players and, and, um, you know, helping them develop in their process, you know, on and off the field as people and, and players, um, something I struggled with out of college. And I think a lot of, a lot of high level athletes struggle with, whether it's after college or after their professional careers are done is how they identify themselves mm. moving forward. And, and by that, I mean, I think any player, and it's a question that I ask my seniors currently, uh, first off, when they say coach, you know, I'm ready to go into the real world. Uh, I tell them to change their verbiage to you're ready to pay bills for the rest of your life. Um, so man, if that and, ain't the if that so, ain't the so truth, change your verb. I hear what you're saying, but change your verbiage. Right? Yeah, yeah. So enjoy this time while it's here. Uh, but I also talk to them, and and I, I you know, I, I pick a few of my seniors, and I tell them, you know, in a minute, tell me who you are without mentioning the game of soccer or football, and without mentioning being an athlete. Tell me who you are. Tell me what your interests are. Tell me what what you what interests you have outside of the game. And like a lot that. of players in any sport really struggle with that uh, yeah. I, know I struggled after my playing career was done and it was like what, what are my interests you know what, who am what I? Do I like who am yeah. I outside who of am I? identifying myself as an athlete my entire life so yeah I, I, if there are younger players listening it's even though you identify yourself as a as an athlete as a as a footballer right now start to identify what you like outside of the game because all of us are much more than just an athlete in the grand scheme of things. And mm -hmm. when it comes down to it, even if you are able to become a professional and, and make money playing a kid's game, that's going to come to an end sooner or at later. At some point, yep, so at you, some you point. You have to identify what other interests you have. And I think this is a great market too with the, with the kids currently now available to, to make money off of their life. 
likeness now. Um, yep. it, it's a perfect situation for the student and athletes to to get into that little area and that little nook of, of being innovative and, and, and learning ways to represent themselves um, and ultimately identify who they are outside of the game. Um, so so I, I'd leave any young aspiring footballer with that is that I know your ultimate goals are to be a footballer collegiately or professionally, but have a talk with yourself and identify who you are outside of the game. And yeah. when you align those two things, it just makes things that much more clear um, as far as your future path and where you're headed. So. Ah, man, that was deep. I'm not, there's nothing left to say after that because that's a, that's a mic drop moment. Um, Armante, my man, I really appreciate you, you taking the time out to chat with me here uh, for the people listening. And, and as I've been talking to more and more of my players and kids who I train, I know a lot of kids listen to these podcasts and I know that they're listening to these, these nuggets, right. That, that people are dropping here. And, and on the flip side, I give it to them. I'm like, yo, you need to check out, you say you want to play NCAA division one. Well, I've got a coach on and he's telling you what you need to do. You know, this is it. Um, so I, I really appreciate it. I mean, you, you're given knowledge that I don't have access to, but I want my kids to be able to listen to, because like you said, at the end of the day, the game ends for all of us as a player and what we are and what, who we are, what we do with it. Right. It, it it's like, did we just play this game for 10, 12 years and then it's nothing? Yep. Or is it 10, 12 years of preparing us for this job, you know? And yep. I, I think that you, you brought up some good points, man. I'm happy to have you on here. I'm very excited to follow you uh, in these next coming years. So um, my man, you, uh, you take care and... For the podcast guests that are on here, thank you for uh, thank you for being a part of this, and we will chat with you later. Take care.